So if I think of the area under this length tension curve, the area under the curve is really your active range of motion. What range of motion can you execute force in? As your angle gets longer or your muscle gets longer, the ability to generate force goes down until you get into what we call your passive range of motion. And then as your tissue gets shorter, the ability to generate force goes down until we hit your short passive range of motion. You will never have access to 100% of your range of motion. It's just physiologically not possible. But the purpose, one of the purposes of FRC is to grab as much of that range as I can. Because if I can grab more control long, and I can grab more control short, I end up increasing the area under the length tension curve, which is to say I increase the amount of usable range of motion you have across an articulation. That can be defined very at a low level as mobility. The ability to use one's angles or one's ranges. Is everyone okay with that? So part of the training in FRC is, can I try to capture passive ranges of motion and make them active? Now you might look at this thing and you go, well, the reason why the curve is as such is because of the sliding filament theory. Do you guys remember the sliding filament theory in physiology? It's the way muscles contract. We have to know this, right? So when a muscle contracts, on each muscle fiber, the fiber is divided into sarcomeres. Sarcomeres are your basic units of muscle contraction. It's the things that have the actin and myosin uh, proteins and cross bridges were made, and then actin and myosin slid past each other, muscle shortened. You guys remember that? Put it in your head, get a good conception of it. Good, it's bullshit. That is not the way muscles contract. It's kind of the way muscles contract, but it's a very dumbed down explanation as to how muscles generate force. Well, mostly because it says that muscles can only generate force linearly, which is not true of muscles. Muscles can generate force in a variety of different positions, because when you contract, the active myosin doesn't only slide past one another, it also separates in different angles. So your, your muscle is much more complicated than you once thought. You might have thought that your bicep just does this, but you only think that because if you take a cadaver and you feed a string through the muscle, and then you pull on it like we did at Bernie's, <laughs> That's how we learn what our muscles do. And we assume that our muscles only contract along the lines of our muscles, so the bicep does this. But the bicep also does that, and this, and that. So when you look at the sliding filament theory, there's more to the story. The sliding filament theory only explains this if there's only one sarcomere in a muscle. If there's one sarcomere in a muscle, the argument goes like this. When the muscle gets too long, all of the actin and myosin is separated, so you can't generate any force. And then the other argument goes, if a muscle is too short, all of the actin and myosin is already crossed over each other and therefore there's nowhere to go. Do you remember this? But the problem is that's only true if there's one sarcomere in muscle. But across one mus muscle cell, you have thousands of sarcomeres. Thousands of sarcomeres. And forgive, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but most of your clients are three-dimensional beings. True or false? Okay, so not only do you have a lot of sarcomeres on one fiber, but there's depth. You have thousands of fibers in a muscle. Each fiber is at a different depth. So depending on where you are, where actin and myosin is is going to be dependent on what depth you're talking 